Um, I'm not going to talk about the plea negotiations and who started it. Um, I think you heard Karen say on the stand that with reluctance she accepted this, and y'all can read between the lines on that. So it's probably the best way to do it. What do you think? You, what, what do you think was? I mean, you know, you obviously worried about any case, but I mean, was it the ten different witnesses from the ten different places? What did you think was kind of your star element for that jury that just pushed it over? I mean, and and the rest may disagree with me. I don't think it was any one witness. I mean, I, yes, the ten that the ten that he made statements to, and the two or three that he had actually made broader confessions to. Uh, that you guys heard from were important. Uh, the co-defendant was important. Um, the corroboration of the co-defendant statement was very important because they were small pieces. They were small pieces that, you know, couldn't be dreamt up. Um, I think this was truly a case where it took putting all of that together to get the, you know, full picture. I don't know if y'all disagree. I think it was everything. Well, you look emotional. I mean, can you explain? Who, uh you know, who could, couldn't be uh, six hard years for her and for Dana and the rest of the uh, family, her daughter, Holly, and we heard the testimony. She was shown absolutely no grace by these defendants. They had chance and chance to let her live. Uh, absolutely no grace, but at the end of the six years, at the end of the Zach Adams story, Holly's family, Karen and Dana, they chose to end this thing with grace. And um, is emotional, is powerful. I think it's the best end to this terrible thing. Nobody has ever seen the, this idea of to see you with a hostile U.S. Marshal witness or a TBI <laughs> agent, this is, this is unprecedented. Even the judge had never seen it. You had to deal with these, this, this, this misled investigation, and then you said, but this second investigation is on the money? I mean, what was that like having to kind of like disqualify and yet give credibility at, this, at the same time to the same agency? Well, I came in three years ago. So when I came in, um, the stage was already set. And so it is a certainly a very different um, than the norm coming in after things have been in place and agencies, different agencies have done different things. Um, and I don't think it was, uh, you used the word discrediting an agency. I never felt like it was discrediting an agency because the agency um, was working all along. Um, I think that we, we uh, Mr. Hagerman started in an opening statement saying about missteps and mistakes, and then uh, Special Agent Booth talked about um, missteps and misdirection. And then you heard from Jack Van Hooser, who came in with a fresh set of eyes and, and was able to put his finger on where the missteps were and, and where to go from there. Um, no question. It was it was different because that doesn't usually happen on cross examination. Um, but um, I think the jury understood what had happened, and, and uh, it's pretty clear by their verdict. You know what what they believed, and you saw the. Did you? I think well, I think what got us through that. I mean, you, like you said, you you saw us confront officer, marshal, you know, whatever it is. I think what got us through that is our job in this case, from the second she got involved and from every second we spent on it, is just to do what is right. Just to do what is right. And if that means standing up or asking certain questions or whatever else it is, you just do what's right. If it meant challenging those who normally might not be challenged, that was part of it in this case. And it meant because of the six and a half years, um, it meant taking an enormous amount of material, just an indescribable amount of material, and um, figuring out from that what we actually needed 
to make a case against to present a case against Zachary Adams because that was um, that was what our job was the last two weeks was the Zachary Adams case. Can you tell me just follow up on that discovery here because there were three things you said like in the jury room that people's mouths dropped open. One was that they didn't alibis weren't checked, which I mean people I mean you could hear in the gasp in here that Shane Austin was cleared because he didn't have a car, so of course he couldn't do it. And and then uh, the third thing that there was a prevailing theory that it could only be one person. Be one person, yes. Astounding. And right. And right. the public is just I mean, what are we supposed to do? It's astounding. It was. And in the end, in the end, as astounding as all of those things are, truth prevailed. And the jury, one after the other, resounding, guilty on all counts, not, not a hesitation exhibited on any of their parts. So I say that to be yes. It was pretty astonishing, but in the end, truth dominated all of that and the Bobos were able to sit here today and make the decision themselves for the first time in six and a half years from when Dana went to work that morning and from when Karen went to work that morning this is the yesterday is probably the first time they've been in control of their family's a destiny their family's desires and wishes and what was going to be best for them going forward i mean and that's probably why she said she saw dana bobo smile for the first time and i'll tell you i'd never seen him smile not one time i didn't know the man had dimples until yesterday and i was like dana bobo so you know the jury did that i mean this this is an incredible county and these people i think worked hard the whole time just paying attention and working through this um just kudos to them follow up on this question do you feel like you lost a lot of physical evidence that could have been gathered had the front had tbi followed what done with the you know i i don't want to talk about you know the evidence in particular because we do have you know we have two more defendants and you know those are different cases against you know different individuals that we have to to work through um I will say, generally speaking, you know, common sense tells you that if you learn something six and a half years after the fact, for instance, you know, it's been out there about finding the gun, and I got to say, there were some people digging that you'd be surprised that knew how to hold a shovel, but um, the point is, like, you find it sometimes, and sometimes you don't, and so, you know, say that with a general terms in terms you know what we might have lost or whatnot can you talk about jason offer at all i mean he goes from being essentially your star witness and now you have to turn around and prosecute him and he's got to be yeah i'm really not going to talk about those that are that are still pending can you just talk about the process the process is the process it, yes it's set in november for a status date which gives us over a month to get with their attorneys and talk to their attorneys and, and um, figure out what the game plan is. A lot of that, of course, depends on them. So. What worried you? What woke you up in the middle of the night about this case? Oh, well, what didn't? <laughs> didn't you assume we went to sleep? Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, yeah. You know, um, uh, for me, and everybody may have a, have a different opinion, for me it was what I talked about earlier, just the sheer mountains of material, much of it not relevant, but still collected, much of it uh, important, and trying to come up with the best, uh, the best way to present what happened to the jury. Uh, a lot of times that's not a problem. You know, you think about it, most cases you guys cover, you got 10 or 15 witnesses, you got five witnesses, six witnesses, you put them on and you're done. And this was totally different. This was trying to figure out um, the different pieces and uh, you know dealing with a lot of people from that were locked up in different locations and finding them and you know following up with them it, it was it was quite a task you met with the jurors uh, very, actually very briefly yes Talk about that. Um, I just took the Bobos up there to meet them and, and thanked them myself and then then left the room so they uh, yeah. 
can you can you discuss at all what aggregating factors you were prepared to argue in this case to seek the death penalty? It's filed in the file. When we filed the death notice two years ago, it's in there. There's that's public public record. Any specific ones that you were going to stress more than others? No, all three of them. I mean, there was three of them, and and, and they're they're in the file. When the jurors asked the question, the second question about um, circumstantial, what was your feeling at that time? I was fine with it. I really was. It was a good sign to you. Um, you know, we'd had another question before then that didn't worry us, and I think in light of the first question, I think we were. I thought their questions were smart questions and thoughtful questions. What was the first question? I don't think the judge released it, so you'll have to. The defense said that they were worried about yes, sir, when we talked to them. They were, they, they were worried they had prepared Jack for a guilty plea. Were you guys worried that it would come back the other way? Always concerned, but I think I think we all felt like that, our, that the witnesses who, who testified were credible, and most of what Every single one of them said was backed up even by something else that was said. So I don't think any of us are ever like quite certain that how something's going to turn out because that's a pretty bold and brassy place to put yourself in that, that we don't generally do. But never stop worrying. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we all felt like it, that the the proof came in because of the sleepless night nights that y'all were talking about came in the way it needed to. And his case is still pending, so we, we can't talk about it. Do you think some of your uh, colleagues, your district attorney colleagues around the state, opine that when the question came in about circumstantial, that, that juries sometimes are looking for permission to convict because they, even though they know circumstantial, they can rule it, they want to make sure and be told again, yes, emphatically, you can use that to prosecute. Did you, did you take it that way? Because other DAs clicked in and, and messaged people and said, oh, they're uh, I wasn't worried about the question. I mean, again, I thought it was a smart question. There was certainly circumstantial proof in this case. And then we had direct evidence, you know, in the form of eyewitnesses who heard and saw things that Zach Adams said and did. So um, I think from certain aspects, circumstantial evidence, you know, played a part. So I don't know whether I started making that leak to oh like I don't, I don't know I wasn't following what people were saying but uh, it didn't I don't, it didn't scare us no. this was a good bunch uh, since there was an agreement made on the sentencing does this mean that he cannot appeal his sentence no it does not mean that it does not mean that he can appeal his sentence but he is agree but there was an agreement as to what the sentence was was there an effort to compel him to testify as part of the agreement saying we're not going to say the death penalty but you go up there and confess and tell his family what you did, you scoundrel? I can't say that there was an effort on the part of, um, you know, yeah. Because if there was an appeal, you could use all that, right? If you made a statement. I, anything that was said under oath would certainly be admissible in any appeal. The, the family didn't need to hear from yeah. him. They didn't need to hear from him. Karen needed to look at him, and she needed to say what she needed to say. But she didn't need to hear from him. And wasn't she graceful and articulate? And you gotta, I think anybody watched her saw the teacher come out and look at me, look, look at me. And then, and then, can you scoot back so he can see me? I mean, she, she wasn't missing a beat. I honestly just think we're all so proud of them and the restraint that they've shown and the um, just good sense through the course of this trial. So it was good for her to get to do that. What will you guys all do tonight? Pack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Pretty pretty keyed up right now still. So. We'll be we'll be sad to leave Savannah tomorrow. We'll be we'll be back. They've treated us great. Oh my goodness. They really have. Dumb. <laughs> Anyway, anything else? All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.